a seat this morning. Great to be with you. I'll tell you, I've been rejoicing all week long. Uh, this is why. I've been rejoicing and bragging about you guys. Uh, last week, um, your, your response to the word overwhelmed my heart. Um, I heard you. I heard you. I heard you affirm that that was the word and that was the truth. And, um, and I believe with all my heart, you, you want to journey with God in the right way. Um, you want to journey with God that you hear from His truth. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I told so many people about what transpired and to see the looks on your faces and to hear even the feedback during the sermon to know that you were with me and that we will stand upon the truth of God and nothing else. Amen? Well, I was watching Fiddler on the Roof I actually really like that movie. I kinda, I'm really kind of into musicals. I'm choosy on that for sure. Uh, there's certain things I, I do not watch. Mamma Mia, I'm not into that kind of stuff. Um, but there are, there are classics that I really, really enjoy. But particularly Fiddler on the Roof is one of them. Um, it's a bittersweet thing because as I watch Fiddler on the Roof, I see things that are very commonly found in Old Testament scriptures. Now, one of those things is Tevye. In the opening scenes, he is actually looking at the camera and he's dialoguing, really honestly talking to the audience, and that would be us. It's the fiddler on the roof. He says, because of tradition, we know who we are and what God expects us to do. And Tevi would say these words, and as the good book says, and they begin to misquote and butcher Scripture thought about that phrase for a moment. I thought about the reality of that. Listen, because of tradition, we know who we are and what God expects us to do. And this is what gets everyone in trouble. This is what the people of God were in trouble for. Tradition started to trump the word of God. If tradition contradicts the word, it should not be tradition. So we said, Lord, we, we want your word. And today may come as a form of encouragement to you. Praise God. It may feel like a rebuke, and it's okay. It may come for correction, and that is okay too. God does all three through his word because he loves you this morning. So I preach the word not knowing or even thinking about circumstances or even past circumstances today. I preach the word faithfully today to show you God's love not only for a people that he was constantly, he called his own and chose them, but for us as well as we look through that lens today uh, through Malachi, be able to see, to hear, to know, and uh, be reassured who God's been in the whole journey, but maybe who we've become or the tendency for us to become. So it could be a warning for some, which is great. We always need that. Um, so this is the word of the Lord today. I'm picking a couple of scriptures. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture. We said we wanted the word, so I'm reading the word today. A lot of the word because I believe this scripture, uh, the, 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 the scriptures that I'll give you kind of give the overarching f message that God was giving, and then I'm going to give the details later on as we go about. I'm starting chapter 2 uh, with verse 10. I'm only reading uh, about a verse and a half. I'm going to skip to verse 17. We'll pray, and then throughout this sermon, you're going to hear the fullness of chapter 2 and 3. And this is the word of the Lord for us today, so would you stand as we read Scripture? Malachi 2, 10. Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do you profane the covenant of your fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. Verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. And he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? God, thank you for a people who are prepared and ready for the word. Thank you, God, that we get to receive it today. 
And as it rests on us, whatever work it needs to do in each individual life, we know that it will do for that particular life, do good for the body as a whole as we receive it and we embrace it and we allow it to change our lives. We pray it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we're going to film the details here particularly, but I want to give you a review because some of you may have not been here on this journey. It's okay. I'm going to give you a, a quick recap because it bears repeating. The review is this. There's a, been a messenger sent to God, what Malachi actually means, to God's people for the purpose of helping them see what they need to see, hear what they need to hear, that they would be an obedient people. The priests were guilty. They are no longer revering and honoring God. His name is not kept in awe. And as a result, this has trickled down to the people. The priests have been accused of something by God, but not before the people of God accused God. And the accusation is, God, when have you loved us? To say God's always loved, we said in Jeremiah, he's loved with an everlasting love. God does not change. But in fact, what they felt was a lack of love from God was truly their own lack of love for him. He never stopped loving him. This is why he brings the word that he does before the people. He loves them so much, he wants them to turn from their wicked ways and follow him and be obedient and love him back. So the command to listen and to teach the people properly was exposed, for they weren't doing that. As we said last week, we want to hear and know and discern nothing but the truth. And you are accountable. The people, again, heard one voice. It was from the priest, and they represented God to the people. They did not have their own Bible. They could not validate what was true or not at the time. Of course, there were some that understood enough about who God was that this was detestable. They remembered the law, and they knew that this was wrong. But for the over, um, for, for over the, the uh, we would say over the whole um, uh, camp of God's people, starting with the priest down, they have fallen from their obedience the priests started showing partiality to the law. They would uphold this one really strictly, but they were very lenient in this other area. Look, nobody gets to pick and choose how they will obey God and then determine, I'm going to repeat this again, that God is pleased with them. His word governs that. So he spoke a word before the people, I will humiliate you. And he had talked about it like a humiliation with dung being spread on their faces, the priests, so all people could see. And they are a stumbling block to the people. And as a result, the people were sinning. Well, we get to a scripture in full as we read it. We're going to find out exactly in what ways the people were sinning. The overall issue here, and this is, this is going to be key for us, understand just a couple of things here. They broke faith with each other. I want you to remember that. They broke faith with each other. Not just with God. They broke faith with each other. So we need to understand oneness a bit. The scripture that we read said, have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking with one another, breaking faith with one another? And it says Judah has broken faith. You break faith with God and as a result, you will be breaking faith with others. We talk about our love for God. We'll keep talking about it. It'll be woven throughout the entire message today. That our love for God intersects our love for one another. What we do with God has a resulting impact on the relationships that we have. And the same is true. How we treat relationship here on earth with one another exposes how we truly love God. So if you break faith with God, and the resulting factor will be you'll be breaking faith with others. If you break faith with uh, others, you will be breaking your faith with God. The two are in relationship and are intertwined. It says the people were one with God and one with another. Uh, one. Maybe, maybe it's, it's it, the one father concept here. Uh, they could be speaking particularly of God being one. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you were to consider just a people, they all came from Adam. Or, or maybe you could say because they were God's chosen people, Israel, and the promise made and the covenant made with Abraham, they were all one people from Abraham. 
They originated as humans from Adam, and they originated as a chosen called people of God in both the same way. They came from one person. And that one God created all of them. When one chooses to act a particular way, knowing the relationship has been made one by God, it affects the whole. Now, if you obey me fully, it says this in Exodus 19, and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God never talks about a singular person. He talks about the group as a whole that he called. Oneness was constant with God's people. It was the message, you are my chosen people. I will be your God and you you will call me God, but I will be your God for you, the people, and you will be my people calling me God or Lord. It's been the constant throughout Scripture, this idea of oneness and connectedness. Why is this important? Because the rest of Scripture doesn't make sense. It just means we can go live our lives and say we love God and try to be obedient to God, but somehow it doesn't translate in our lives left and right of us, and then we honestly will be in the same boat that the people in this particular passage of Scripture were were in, and they were defiling now the God of the universe and His name. They were defiling doing detestable things as a result, not understanding this oneness concept. And what's interesting is the sins that God calls the people out on are truly ripping apart oneness. Throughout all of Scripture, Colossians 3.12, it's a setup here, but oneness is constant here. Therefore, as God's chosen people, now that is to all those that believe in Jesus Christ, not just Israel, chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And if you move to Romans 12, 5, so in Christ we are many who form one body, and each member belongs to the other. So when we're like, my faith is my own, it is not, it never has been. If that was ever preached or taught to you, go read your Bible, it is not your own. Yes, you must individually make a decision for Christ, but the moment you make that decision, you enter into the one body. Remember that. There's sins that broke the faith with one another. Let me read the chapter. It'll be pretty obvious to you, but let me read it to you, and we'll just break down why this is really important or what was going on at the time. Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, Whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Now, uh, let me bring some clarity to the scripture here. God had brought the people together. This was God's chosen people. He had made promises for the people, made a covenant with the people, but he had also set forth his boundaries for the people. It's not like, and I have many friends, that seem to intersect different cultures, different backgrounds, different ethnicities. All of that is fine. That that has no bearing on it. But there's something at the root here that God is getting to for the people. If God brought them together, God chose them, God loved them, then God desired to be glorified in and through every single one of them to all of the nations. If a dirty person hugs a clean person, the clean person will not put their cleanness upon the dirty person, the dirty person will put the dirtiness upon the clean person. It's just what it is. And they were committing spiritual adultery with God. There's something else that they were actually committing, adultery with one another. But they chose fleshly and worldly things over God. How? Well, when we consider how we unite ourselves with people, when we choose to marry someone, it's just not... Oh, you know, we, we're, we have so much in common and we like all the great things and we're like the same age and we have the same kind of dreams. All those might play, some of those things might play into it. But really, when you unite yourself with someone, when one man and one woman unite themselves in marriage, it is in one mind, one body, and with emotions. But there's one other thing that has to be considered and many people never think about it. When you unite yourself with another person, you're uniting with them spiritually as well. Now these these wives that they were taking had devotion and worship towards someone completely or objects that were not of God. 
pagan worship, idols, whatever you, whatever you call it, they were taking wives of other nations who chose to worship other gods, which were really all false gods, but they were detestable practices amongst these people. So God had set forth not to do this. He says, this is detestable before me. Exodus 34, 14 through 16. Do not worship any other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. For when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifices to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Somehow, God knew that by marrying, that there would be practices down the road that would defile the whole camp. It would give permission to everyone now to go down a path in which God was no longer revered and kept in awe and really no longer becomes their God. You can't have both. You must choose God, serve Him, and love Him alone. When you unite yourself in relationship, and really the New Testament talks about not being uh, unevenly yoked. I know a lot of people... Uh, this has transpired. I'm not going to uh, speak um, in ways that, that makes anybody feel guilty here, but the reality is, is there's many people that have gotten married that were not evenly yoked. Some of those relationships have worked out. Others have not at all. And there's a reason why. When you unite yourselves, you unite yourselves spiritually. And when you don't serve the same God, it doesn't matter what kind of dreams, hopes, uh, things that you have in common, when the one thing that is most important to have in common is the Lord your God, it does not work out very well. It becomes cumbersome. It becomes defiling as well to the family. So you have kids now with one unbeliever and one believer. This becomes very difficult. Now, Paul speaks these things in a more difficult way, which I'm glad that he brings some clarity. But the reality is, is many people take marriage very lightly in this area. So we just get married and we'll roll the dice. Or there'll even be the sense of what one of the spouses is going to say, well, I could convert them. That is very very dangerous. We'd always speak of something else. Whenever I would go to marry some, uh, to officiate a wedding and we're going to have marriage counseling, I speak to them being united in faith. They have to. If one of them believes in another guy, I cannot bring them together. It's not even scriptural. I can't do it. Why? Because God has set forth this union that must be pure in all aspects, especially devotion to God. Well, there was a practice now, and the practice became a practice of the generations that follow. And before you know it, they have intertwined themselves, not just with beautiful women from different countries, but women that actually worship another god. And as a result, those people were made dirty because of their connection in that way. Again, you can't hug a dirty person and put your cleanness on them. When you hug a dirty person, you too become dirty. And God had pointed this out in this reality. And so this was detestable. Because they were marrying people that pulled them away from their relationship with God. Now, they're upset at God. It's kind of funny. Malachi 2, 13. Let me go there real quick. Another thing you do, the Lord says, because they're upset. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because you have no longer paid attention, uh, um, because he has no longer paid attention to your offerings and does not accept them with pleasure from your hands. And this is the people you ask, why? It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth. I'm going to come back to that, but I want you to understand something. People do not see their own disobedience. God has to point that out. Sometimes God has to use people and in, in proper relationship where there's trust. That can, be ha that can happen in your life, and it's a wonderful thing. When you have a brother that you can trust or a sister you can trust, or there's a relationship even amongst the marriage where you can show each other, point them back on path, it's a beautiful thing. It's something that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. But God is intentionally, through a messenger, pointing out their disobedience. And, and sometimes we'll I wonder, where's God in all of this? God isn't answering my prayers. God isn't receiving my offerings. I'm crying out for justice, God. Do you see me in my circumstance? Do you see me in my plight? Do you see where I'm at in life? Can't you see the problems I have? Can't you see the people that oppress me? Can't you see my enemy when all along they're praying a prayer to God where they expect an answer 
and yet they're in a relationship with God that is broken. Not because of God, but because of them. Because they don't see their disobedience. Divorce was made easy in those days. And it was done flippantly for ridiculous reasons. For absolutely ridiculous reasons. Let me go on to the scripture. It says, it is vi- because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth. This is why he's not answering your prayers. This is why he's not accepting your offerings. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of the marriage covenant. This marriage that God was talking about was a long-lasting marriage. They had been married for a very, very long time. And then there was permission given. Then there was a thought to it. Well, I'm just, I'm kind of done here. Maybe she burned the toast. It was for ridiculous reasons that they were divorcing. And guess what? The priests were allowing it. Wow, there's that new young thing over there, exotic looking. I think I'll take her for a wife, and I will dismiss the wife of my youth. How dare any person expect God to answer prayers and cries towards him when they live in complete disobedience like this? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. This is the Shema, this is... The, the, this is what the people had leaned on and knew and understood in De- Deuteronomy 6 as, as who God was, the de- declaration of who God was. And let me just put this in kind of a, a really easy way. God is in perfect relationship with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They acknowledge the Lord being one God. He chose to bring a people together to be one people, and now they are all one. And now the people chose to break the oneness, to rip away from the relationship because divorce was rampant. Unfaithfulness to one another was very prevalent, and they were constantly breaking the covenant they had made with one another, and so they were corrupting the whole. They didn't just break faith. They began to call what was evil good. Did you catch that? You have wearied the Lord with your words, says the messenger. How have we wearied him, wearied him, you asked? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. And he, he's pleased with them. Now, maybe they don't say that in that kind of sense to say, but they would absolutely pronounce themselves as the righteous ones. They'd be the ones to say first that they're the ones that love God, that they know uh, that they're in relationship, and yet a messenger comes and say, no, it's broken. Actually, you're not. You're rejecting the relationship, the perfect relationship that God has given you. And in the same breath, there's another complaint. Where is the God of justice? Now, what does, where is the God of justice mean? So we know they've broken faith with each other. Now they constantly cry out to God. They want justice upon their own lives to the people that maybe oppress them, persecute them. They want themselves to be protected by God. Yet they're living in sin, so they're crying out for God for relief. At the same time, defiling a relationship. And they ask this question, where is the God of justice? This was an accusation that God was not a God, a God of justice. Because they don't see God coming to their defense. God is a just God. We will read it next week. God has never changed. Zephaniah 3.5 says this, and I'm going to start to detail out because the scripture does what it looks like for God to be a just God. If we live flippantly, if we live disobedient lives, there's no way we should think God should answer our prayers. Or have you learned another way and you thought, well, if I just continue to press, when God's saying, no, this relationship is broken, how dare you think that somehow I will answer you in the way that you deem so? I'll be honest with you, though. I think there's ways to live in this life that look like God's answering prayers, but we're doing all the work ourselves. There's ways to live in disobedience, claim God as your God, be successful in the world, and then say, this is the blessing of God. Because we live in America. And because you might have got an education. Or because you're really smart, and you do well, and you work hard. Those are great things, by the way. But please do not attach that 
to God's favor and blessing in your life when you know you're living in disobedience. Isn't it awesome that God, you guys are like, you guys are looking at me like, with a, I'm going to just stop right now with like a stare like, oh, I'm trying to think about my own life. Whoa, that's deep, Pastor. Isn't it awesome that God would actually reveal that to you? That's how much he loves you. He doesn't want you to live a life like that. He doesn't want you to be duped that, you know, you've got a college education and you got a great career and you're making money and you've got the house with the white picket fence or whatever. Kids are going to private school, all those other things. And to think somehow, man, this is the blessing of God. He wants you to know those blessings, you would not have any of that if it weren't for me. But those blessings you want to claim as your own have been worked for and you've worked so hard at those things, you've ignored the one relationship that really, really counts and so this is some correction for the people. They don't get to live this way. It becomes crazy. Zephaniah 3.5 says, The Lord within her, Jerusalem, that's God's people, is righteous. He does no wrong. So the Lord within Jerusalem, who's unrighteous, is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. God acts justly because he is a holy God and he's holy in nature and that holiness just dispenses justice. He acts righteously alone. God does not in inflict undeserved hurt or pain or punishment. Genesis eighteen twenty five. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? That is Abraham making a declaration upon the Lord and then pleading with him for the situation with, with Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, if there's somebody righteous, you wouldn't destroy them if they were there, right? You, to, to destroy the unrighteous, you wouldn't allow your wrath to come upon the righteous. And they begin to have a little conversation. And Adam, or Abraham says, 50, God? What if there's 50? I will not destroy 40, God. It goes all the way down to 10. God is just. God does not give the same, will deserve punishment that goes, goes upon the unrighteous. He does not give that for the righteous. They were a people who did not, again, see their own disobedience. But they questioned it. Instead, they wondered, God's not answering prayers for me. So obviously, he's, is he a just God? And what will get in the way of you knowing that God is a just God is your sin and your disobedience. So the people called for a God of justice, the God who is going to judge them for their lifestyle of injustice. Malachi 3, 5. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. The people called for a God of justice, yet they lived in this way. There were sorcerers in their midst. These were posers of the church, or posers of the truth, workers of deceit. Go to Deuteronomy 18. The Lord talks about it. Remember I told you there's going to be a lot of scripture. I'm just painting the picture for you that God's painted all along for the people. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices div divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist, or who consults of the dead. When men tell you to consult mediums and spirits who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? This is Isaiah 18, 19. Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? God is offended, for he should be the one inquired of in all things. You might go, well, we don't know if we have witchcraft people here, or sorcerers, or whatever. I'd go as far as to say this, that you choose man's word over God's word. That is scary. If man gives a word, a friend gives a word, you better go to scripture and know that that is scripturally sound. If you hear a sermon preached from here to anywhere on the internet, you go and validate it in scripture. For you won't know the sorcerer, the one who practices these things, for you'll be deceived. How do you know you're deceived? You don't, because you're deceived. 
And as a result, you will listen and you'll be obedient. Adulterers, those who wanted to be married to the world and, to God, and not to God, and those who treated marriage with their spouse with contempt. How about the liars? These are perjurers who speak deceit and don't honor their word at all. Revelations 22, 15 talks about both. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Then he speaks of those cheating others of their wages. These are, again, you got to understand this one. These are self-indulgent people. They are hordes. James 5, 4 says, look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who, who mowed your fields and are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Then there's the oppressors of widows and orphans and deprivers of aliens of their justice. Listen, they had the tendency to consume every resource they could, leaving no space to help those less fortunate. May God shut this church down if that becomes us. We are not about ourselves. We are about giving glory to God and that we would meet the needs of others. The Nazarene church is founded on looking after the needs of those oppressed. And they're called out as a people, from the priest down to the people, for ignoring it. Because why? They became hordes. They became a self-indulgent people. We'll do as we please. We'll call upon God anytime we want, but we'll live our life in such a way that it actually hurts the neighbor in every direction. Marrying foreign gods, divorce, and not paying attention to the less fortunate, in fact, taking advantage of anyone in that situation, in every single way, it means that you're not loving your neighbor. And what's the greatest command that Jesus said? To love God and to love neighbor. Amen. This is why God's pointing out these sins, and it's because they were there in the camp of these people, and they showed partial partiality in these things, divorce and taking advantage of the innocent. Every one of these people that God spoke of, spoke of protects, is, has his protection. It says this, in Deuteronomy 24, do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother, Israelite, or an alien living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may, not, he may cry out to, against you and you will be guilty of sin. Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. Religion that our God, Father, our God our Father accepts is this, is pure and faultless. To look after orphans and widows in their distress, not exploit them, and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. They exploited these people. And you might think, wow, this is really an evil people. Is that not the tendency today of people? Are we so self-indulgent that we have no extra for anyone? Do we find ourselves consumers in such a way that there is nothing left to help those in need? If so, we're just as guilty. He talked about a fire coming, and it's going to do one of two things. It's going to purify or consume. The Lord saw it a day where he would come. He was calling people. Who would even stand in his presence? And it said this, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messengers of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites, those are the priests, and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be accepted to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. The Lord wants to purify his people. The rebellious and the disobedient will be consumed one day. The guilty will be found guilty and it will be expedited quickly because the witness against him is the Lord Almighty. God didn't want his people to be destroyed at all. The message and the warnings 
were an act of love. Listen, God knows that a loose, intimate relationship with him results in compromise, sin, and even justification of that sin. In fact, at some place, it's not even justification of sin. What is sin anymore is called good. We see it in our culture rampantly. May it never be so in the church. And the patterns will be taught to the generations to come, won't they? I got two things for you this morning. Hang with me. I think these are really important, and they're needed by us today. Knowing what we know, this can be our tendency as well. We've seen it. We've seen it over the course of time. We've seen it. Maybe you've seen it in the church. Maybe you've seen it in your family. Maybe you've seen it in prior generations. I pray that we would put it into it. The only way we could put an end to what God's called his people all along to, which is really holy living, is that we must guard ourselves in our spirit. Remember that applies to the marriage thing. They didn't think about that. They saw with their eyes what looked, what looked uh, pleasurable to the eyes and they never thought about what could uh, what would absolutely corrupt the soul. And so we need to guard ourselves in our spirit and not break faith. And there's two ways to do this. And I'll be honest with you, this is, this is what it comes down to because this is what the Lord had called the people for, to do. And if they had actually done this, if they'd actually done this, it would have been a turning away and a glorious thing. And there was a day coming which God was gonna do work. He could see it, but he's called all people to this. He's called them to obedience. And so I believe this, one of two things here. Both included, choose obedience. Why do I say that? This is not a matter of progress. This is a matter of obedience. You cannot say, well, I am on a journey. I'm progressing. You either do it or you don't do it. It's a pretty harsh word, isn't it? But it's the truth. We either do it or we don't do it. There is no half obey. There is no half obey. Now, The Karate Kid, the 1984 film... There's a conversation between Mr. Miyagi and Danielson. And Mr. Miyagi says, now ready? And Daniel says, yeah, I guess so. And Mr. Miyagi replies, Danielson, we must talk. They get on their knees. Walk on road, hmm? Walk left side, safe. Walk right side, safe. Walk middle. Sooner or later, get squished just like grape. Here, karate, the same thing. Either you karate do yes or karate do no. You karate do mm, guess so. Just like great. You can't half love. Love is actually the condition that causes us to be obedient. We say that we love God, so you have to let it be seen in all your decisions that you are resolute to obey God and be purposeful and be unwavering. We must love others the same way. So our obedience to God is not only loving God, but it's loving others, and it's being resolute to do so. Amen. Speaking of marriage and relationship, because God did in this passage in this sin, I love that everything is redeemable and that God can do a work in any of our lives if we so allow him to do I love that about God's grace, mercy, and his forgiveness. But whatever you thought about marriage, maybe you're thinking about marriage. Marriage is not about uh, magic. Oh, you know how we feel. and Oh, this is just, this is so great. It was destiny. It's about moments of clear decision-making, unwavering and purposeful decisions. And if you ask anyone who's had any block of time, longevity in marriage, they would say, number one, God was a part of that but each couple made a decision to move forward. There might be some fight in that. There might be some drag in that, but the resulting factor, it wasn't about magic. It was about moments of purposeful decision. You may not feel like loving, but you decided every day of your life to do it. We're not absent of feelings, but I believe in those decisions, feelings do follow, and that is wonderful. This is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. 
Obedience comes out of the love that we have for God. And it's John, 1 John, that doesn't separate it. To know God is to obey God. To love God is to obey God. To say I love God means you love your brother. Homework, go read 1 John to gain that understanding. Don't assume that God is distant. So you must commit to obedience. There's no halfway. There's no, mm, guess so. It's got to be a commitment. But you have to constantly then examine where your obedience is at. Whose side are you on? It's a little story. Abraham Lincoln it was during the Civil War, and there was pastors that gathered at a pastor prayer practice, and they wanted to pray for Abraham Lincoln. And a pastor said, uh, uh, President, let us pray that God is on our side. And he responded, no, no. And he rebuked that. He says, let us pray that we are on God's side. Amen. Those are two different things, church. We can go so far down the road that we assume this life is all about God showing up and coming to where we are when all along what matters most is that we know where God is. He lives in righteousness, holiness, and perfection, and he invites us in. Let us, let us put, put together, all together, put aside the thought, dismiss it, or be warned to never ever embrace the thought that somehow God just needs to show up in my life all the time when God is waiting for you to show up to where he is at. So examine yourselves to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not, you will not do anything wrong. Not that the people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is for your perfection. Paul's words to the church of Corinth. You were made to glorify God when, when a perfect, uh, purification happens, and we are living a life of obedience. There will be a harvest of righteousness, including our offerings to God, our worship, the things we bring to forth the God that will spring from our hearts. Church, do you know that purification? Do you know that way of life? It comes by a spirit. It is in you. We're not ever left wanting. God provides all that we need to obey him. He says that my, my ways, my commands are not burdensome. Why are they not burdensome? Because God puts a new spirit in you and the war that you have with the flesh becomes less and less over time. Not because you are in progress, but because you've chosen obedience may we be a people though we love the word and we said thank you for the word the word of truth that we would choose to be obedient how will we choose to be obedient if we take the full scope of this passage for us would we not consider that somehow again choose obedience but assess where obedience is at every day of our lives examine it where would we find ourselves tomorrow or the next week if we lived lives like that what changes could God do in our lives as we would choose obedience? And I would tell you this much too. It's just not about change in our lives. That that's the work he does. What needs would we meet in the world today that they would see <laughs> and never question whether or not there's a just God? Because God's on their side, so will the people of God and we will show up and we will meet that need and they too will know the love of Jesus Christ. Praise God.